Hey everybody, thank you so much for being here. I am Felicia from Sweet Georgia and the School of Sweet Georgia. And today we're gonna to have a conversation with Jana Maria Valley. She's our tapestry instructor at the School of Sweet Georgia. And she's the owner of Everly Yarn and Everly Textiles. She has been teaching tapestry weaving for uh, over a decade now. And she teaches both in person and she's been teaching online classes with us at the School of Sweet Georgia for the past couple of years. Now, today we're gonna to have a conversation because we are really excited about the possibility of bringing people who are kind of curious about tapestry, bringing them into their first experience of weaving tapestry. We're starting a tapestry study group that begins on May the 12th, and it's all about learning the fundamentals of tapestry. Like, how do you warp the loom? How do you lay in the weft? How do you make shapes? How do you blend colors? All of those kinds of things, Jana is gonna lead us through those steps. Now, if you're wondering if you need a lot of stuff or a lot of gear in order to get started with something like tapestry, it's really, really very, very simple. You can get yourself a very small little handheld loom like this one. This is the one that Jana's actually making for Everly Textiles. Um, you can get these off of our website, the Sweet Georgia website, sweetgeorgiayarns.com. You can also get them from Jana at the everlyyarns.com website as well. And then you'll need something to warp up your loom with. In this case, we have this yarn available on the Sweet Georgia site. It's the Ash warping thread. As for weft yarn, you can use what you have in your stash, you can use scraps, you can use fingering weight yarn, you can use whatever you have lying around, or if you like, you can invest in a little bit of tapestry yarn. This is yarn from Gist, it's called Array. It's their new tapestry weaving yarn. And this is a yarn that you can um, double up, triple up, quadruple up, you know, use multiple strands in order to get the weight that you need for your weaving. So this is something that you can experiment with as well. So just between a few of these things, you can get started weaving tapestry. So I hope that you'll stay for the conversation with Jana where we talk a little bit more about her background, how she got into tapestry weaving, why she likes it so much, and how you can get started as well. Looks good. Your shawl looks great. Thanks. Yeah, I love it. It's so fun to like put matter root with matter root, like wear the sweater and the red that's in the shawl. Oh my God. Love it. Thank you so much for being here today, Jana. Thanks for talking to me today. I know that we talked a little bit when we were filming um, at your space in uh, Madeira Park in Sunshine Coast, when we came and filmed a tapestry class with you, but we haven't really like sat down and had a conversation like this. I'm looking forward to it. Since 2008, I've been kind of super immersed in the fiber art world. And that's when I entered into Capilano University's textile art program. And um, I had started knitting around 2003 or 2002. And that was kind of the extent of my mm, fiberness, fiber background until I went into textile art school. And, um, you know, ever since then, I've just been kind of going with the flow and finding where I belong because doing a two-year technical degree at CAP really exposes you to a million different techniques. Um, and that program has since closed, sadly. But um, after the first year, I remember being like, I don't know if I want to do the second year because how much more could they teach me? Like there's just, there every week there was like a new technique we were learning. Um, I thought, oh, the second year must just be, you know, um, like, now we work on all the things we learned in first year, but no, the second year was every week again, new techniques. So I came out of there and was a bit overwhelmed by all of, you know, and I was very, even back then, quite entrepreneurial. And I thought, okay, what am I going to do to like turn this into a business of some sort? Um, and then I remember a lot of my colleagues were not moving on to finish their fiber degree. And I was, and I remember thinking, oh, good, I have two more years to not have to worry about that. <laughs> good. Um, so I moved to Montreal and I finished my fiber arts degree at, Cap, uh, at um, Concordia University, which is much more conceptual, but their facilities were amazing. So I could use all of the different things that I had learned if I wanted to. Um, and there, they had a, they have, it's still there, a huge weaving um, studio with many looms, knitting machines, and then a huge printing and dyeing studio. Um, like, I think the dye studio must be a thousand square feet. Yeah, I kind of just um, experimented a lot with natural dyes while I was there. 
um, some tapestry weaving, a lot of like sculptural, performative, um, experimental things, some audio stuff. So as I was finishing my degree at Concordia, I became pregnant with my son, who's now nine. And we moved when he was seven months old to New York City. And um, I didn't have a working visa at the time. I thought I was going to, but my, my visa didn't come with a working permit. So we were there for three years. His visa, our visas were good for five years, but I could only hack three years of low income, low income, no work living <laughs> in New York. Uh, not that it was all bad at all. It was a hoot, like just a lot of fun. Um, my son and I basically lived in Chelsea, um, walking the galleries. Yeah. So, oh, while I was there, that's what I was going to say is I started weaving tapestries. So we lived in a shoebox. We lived in the tiniest apartment. I think it was about 400 square feet all in, um, bed, kitchen, living room, bathroom. And um, the only thing that I could think of that made sense to continue my art practice was weaving tapestry because I could weave on a small loom. And at the time, what I loved um, to weave on is just was a simple PVC or copper pipe loom. They're a great option for beginning. And um, but Mirix Looms reached out and saw what I was doing and offered me a free 16 inch Mirix Loom in exchange for blogging. And it kind of just steamrolled from there. I got in, you know, I dyed my own yarns with natural dyes and wove with them and knit with them. And in 2016, we moved back to BC. Um, and two years later in 2018, my son entered kindergarten. And that's when I thought, okay, now if I want to launch a business, now's the time. So that's when I launched Everly Yarn, which is um, naturally dyed organic merino. Um, and um, I also make tapestry looms. Um, so the yarn that I use in my tapestry practice is actually designed as knitting yarn, but um, I like to use it, especially the fingering weight um, for um, tapestry weaving. Yeah, and that's actually becoming more and more common in the tapestry world where it's not just tapestry yarn that people are using. I'm amazing. Kind of I have so many story. questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is great. This is great. I love it. Um, I have so many questions for you because I, I think that, um, you know, going back to your conversation about like studying at Capilano and about how they gave you so many different techniques to try, um, to experiment with so many different techniques and uh, not necessarily going back and revisiting them, but just letting you explore all of these different things um, so that you could be exposed to things and then choose what you want to go forward with mm -hmm. at a later date. I feel mm -hmm. like that's a little bit of where I am right now is just knowing that there's so many things that I don't know and so many things that there are to explore, not necessarily knowing where to begin or how to absorb them and in what order. Um, mm -hmm. I think going to a school like that is a great foundation for for getting your hands into each yeah. one of these things, right? Yeah. So, I mean, with all of this exploration and trying your hand at different things, were there some techniques that you were like, oh, I love this, and other techniques are like, uh, I don't know, I don't think that this is for me? I was having a hard time negotiating between what was possible to turn into a business and what I left liked and what I enjoyed. So looking back, I definitely saw that there was evidence that I was very interested in tapestry, but I mean, it was the first weaving um, type of weaving that they taught us because you're manipulating with your hands, the warp and the weft, and you really get a good idea of um, um, just the relationship between those two things and also how sheds work and um, set. And, um, but I just thought, oh, they're teaching us this because of those reasons, not because we should do more of it. <laughs> because it's so slow. It takes so long to weave tapestry. Yeah, I'm curious about, because we, we talked about this before, about how tapestry, because you've mentioned before, like tapestry is like the slowest form of weaving ever, because you're packing yeah. down those wefts in order to cover the warp yarn, and it just requires so many picks in order to make anything yeah. happen. And so... 
Mm. With this super slow practice, what is it that you really love about it that keeps you coming back, that gets you excited to say, oh, I, I get to do another tapestry? Like, what is it about it that brings you back? Well, the fact that it operates with a discontinuous weft. So with other weaving, types of weaving, you're shooting your shuttle or your bobbin all the way from one side of your loom to the other and back and forth and back and forth. And you can change colors, but typically you're just going back and forth um, from one salvage to the other. With tapestry, you can start, uh, you're working bottom up, but you can start anywhere on that plane and create pictures. So it's kind of, it's the most painterly um, kind of weaving. You can really project whatever image you want onto it. Um, and um, because it's, again, because it's um, left-faced, the, those pictures kind of stack on top of each other. The warp gets totally covered by the weft that you're weaving in. Um, and that's why it takes so long. And honestly, I think for me, as someone who's, I've got a busy mind, it it is really helpful for me to have that place. It's very meditative for me to go back and just kind of work and um, be in the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, because tapestry is also very calculative. Like you're never just mindlessly weaving. You're like, there's a bit of, there's troubleshooting always. So it's kind of this, like, you got to focus um, and look at your cartoon and notice what you're doing and kind of um, always be working out what this bobbin's doing in relation to the bobbin next to it. And um, there's all sorts of things to kind of work out while you're, you're doing it. And I love that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I can see that. Like um, when I think about tapestry, like you, you're making these little looms right now, just like about five inches, these little mini looms. I have it right here. Yeah, you're making these little mini looms now, these Everly mini looms, which are super adorable. But I can see how in this small little area, there's still a ton of decisions to be made. Like literally every time you put your weft in, every single pick, you're wondering, do I interlock these? Do I make a slit? How do I arrange them? Do I blend them? Do I, there's a lot mm -hmm. of decisions to be made around all of that, right? Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about while you're weaving? Because I mean, I'm wondering if this becomes like second nature to you where making these decisions pick after pick, you're like, mm -hmm. get into it and you don't have to think so much about it anymore. What else do you think about? I don't know what I'm thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, you know, like my my sister-in-law, one night I was laying in bed and I was, this is actually, I don't know why this is, memory came up, but um, when I was at Cap University and I was in this design class and I was getting excited about color theory and and I was like, one night I got very excited about the, the idea of mixing pinks and like highly saturated reds. And I uh, like, <laughs> Told, I was telling her about this, how excited I was. And she was like, wow, Jenna, I never think about stuff like that. Like that just like, I can't believe you're just like laying there thinking about pink and red. I'm like, yeah, that's just kind of how I work. My first instincts in school to, to like, you know, always be thinking about what can I turn this into business-wise and thrive in this industry, I always was trying to like create things that would be more in production, you know, like I was making dolls, I was making pillows, I was knitting garments. And I thought they have to be kind of replicatable. And, and I found after time that that was really not satisfying for me and that I needed the different all the time, you know, I need as an artist to, to be, um, surprised by the outcome and of course handwork there's always something that it is surprising and interesting but with tapestry um there's a couple reasons why it's especially surprising and exciting but and one of them is that you're weaving it backwards so you don't really fully get to see the front of your tapestry until the end and i think for a lot of people that would drive them crazy but for me i love that i just think it's so interesting and I, a lot of a lot of the things that I weave um, until recently have been abstract so um, 
you know, I can take it off the loom and go, oh, maybe it wants to be on its side. Maybe it wants to be upside down and kind of just play around with its orientation too. Um, but in terms of weaving, the weaving itself, um, and I mean, going also going back to just like what I'm thinking about, that's what keeps me going as a weaver and in the moments of weaving is not knowing what it's gonna look like exactly. And just being kind of, being able to continue to be creative in the moment. It's not a predictable outcome. And I, I love that. Um, also, I think the materials matter. So I've tried to work with yarns that are designed for tapestry and I haven't been as, I don't know, it just didn't give me the excitement. Even if I was dyeing it myself, it just felt flat. And I don't know, there was something about working with some of the yarns um, and I haven't tried them all, but that made me go, I'm just gonna work with what I have in the studio and see if that works. And I really enjoyed mm -hmm. weaving with the yarn that I was knitting with, so. Yeah, so this is a really interesting question too, is about, um, you know, weaving with tapestry. You know, a lot of people have taken your tapestry class and are wanting to learn how to do tapestry. And we're gonna talk more about having this tapestry study group and having you participate and lead people and teach people and guide people in this entire process. But one of the questions is around like, is it okay for us to use knitting yarn in a tapestry? Um, you know, knitting yarns have a lot of uh, characteristics that maybe other weaving yarns or even tapestry yarns don't necessarily have and so <clears throat> is it okay it's a little bit of a artistic question technical question um I feel like there's a lot of different answers but I'd love to hear what you your thoughts are about this so the reason knitting yarn isn't recommended for tapestry is because it's um the more plies you have the more kind of, and also there's a lot that goes into it, as you know, as a spinner. Um, but anything that's like too bouncy and too lofty and has too much air in there is one, not as easy to pack down. So it kind of wants to bounce up and it it creates a different kind of fabric. Um, and that's the gist of it is that it's, it's not, it's not designed to be packed down and to be like a weft faced fabric. It's designed to be like airy and bouncy and like squishy and have drape. Um, whereas tapestry is this flat, dense thing that you hang on a wall or you put on your floor as a rug. Um, so, I mean, especially speaking of rugs, you I wouldn't weave a rug out of knitting yarn because it would just, it's not designed to be walked on. Um, so that just, technically wouldn't be my choice. Um, but I like, the reason I like, I said, my favorite um, Everly yarn to, to weave tapestry with is the fingering weight yarn because it's two ply. And so just like knitting, when you're, you know, when you're knitting with anything three ply or up, you get more stitch definition. The same goes for tapestry. If you're weaving with a two ply yarn, it's going to kind of blend into the line below it more than if you were weaving with a three ply or more ply yarn. Um, so that that definitely, uh, I can show you right now. This this is a tapestry that's that I'm weaving with as a sample with the fingering weight yarn. That and is then, super lovely. And then in contrast, this is worsted weight, which is a four ply. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I like how with the finer yarns, you just, you get more granularity. I mean, there's just, yeah. it's almost like having more pixels, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Really lovely. Um, because we're talking about yarn and because we're talking about Everly yarn, we're talking about hand dyed yarn and natural dyed yarn. Can you talk a little bit about the shawl that you're wearing and also the sweater that you're wearing because they are all yeah. your beautiful yarn. Thank you. Um, so this is my favorite shawl of all time. When I, it's the Ambershore shawl by um, Vancouver based designer and um, Latvian born um, 
what's her name? Anise Sang. Sorry, I had a I had a moment there, but um, this is her design. She designs um, beautiful shawls. And when I first started knitting this, when I decided, because I had to have this shawl and I'd never knit a fingering weight shawl before. And I thought, I'll just knit one fingering weight shawl. It'll be this one. It's too great. Like knitting fingering weight, anything. If I'm going to knit it in the fingering weight, it'll be a sweater, you know, something I'll, that feels like it's worth all the effort. But for this, I really needed this. And now I'll never knit another shawl in any other weight because it's such nice fabric. Like, oh, I love it. Um, and uh, I knit it in three of my colorways. So I've got um, Burnt Matter, which is this red. And this is also what the sweater is knit in. Um, and then I've got um, Cosmos, which is the darker blue, which is dyed with cochineal and then over dyed with indigo so cochineal is a mexican cactus beetle um and then i've got um the lightest indigo that i dye which is i call water yeah it's gorgeous it's so yeah. pretty yeah and i, I love, love how then you have like a coordinated sweater and shawl yes. together i know i love wearing the two matter roots together it's it's too fun um and this is the uh, Magnolia Bloom sweater, which is actually, um, it calls for double the weight of yarn that um, it's a bit confusing when you buy the pattern because it says these two yarns should be held double, but actually they should be held quadruple. So there's two, I think if I were to match my gauge properly, I would have had this knit in a two worsted weight yarns plus two fingering weight yarns and instead I just because I had someone sample knit this for me I had them knit it in one way one fingering weight yarn and one worsted I really worsted I really fingering held double so it kind of like has a bit more drape and is less dense and I love it though like it's still a great sweater um it has more of like a cottony feel like it's kind of a spring sweater even though it's a thicker knit because it's airy and yeah it it looks super super comfortable um yeah it is i totally you totally make me want to make that sweater too <laughs> <laughs> oh my god I do, I do that with pretty much everyone that reaches out to me and is like what should i knit this pattern in and i go oh how about these two colors and i'm like now i want to do that <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly so i think it's really really great that we're going to have this tapestry study group and then have you lead it and guide people through the process of learning the, the fundamentals of tapestry i know that you teach tapestry in your um in your own studio like in person with people live and in person it sounds crazy now mm -hmm. but yeah <laughs> right. actually it does happen and so jana you do teach um at your studio but then we also have these classes online through the School of Sweet Georgia where you've taught a lot of these techniques. Um, I think it's interesting on your website, you talk about how there's more than you think. There more to is learn to than learn. you think, yeah. Yeah, there's more to learn than you think. There's all sorts of things that I, as a new tapestry weaver, um, one of the things that I had to change pretty quickly was that I like, I started fiddling with every turnaround point. So I, you know, you put your finger, I put my finger in and make sure that that turnaround point isn't too lofty isn't too bubbly um, and then I push it down and then I make my bubbles and then I beat it and at first I was like oh my god one more thing to make tapestry like that much slower I can't just weave and turn around and beat 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 I have to go in and <laughs> fix and now it's just automatic I don't even think like I just go in and I do it and it doesn't feel like extra work I yeah. think that is when things feel the best is when you're like able to to make those little movements and they're almost like subconscious because they just it's part of your muscle memory now you just know to do it and and it becomes so natural and I think that when you get to that point that's when it's going to feel really really good to do this mm, work yeah. um yeah I'm really excited that we're going to get started with this tapestry study group and uh invite everybody who's been side, kind of like standing on the side and a little bit curious about tapestry but don't really know where to start and I I really like being able to film with you in, in person because then we can get super close to your work we can see your hands we can see the turnaround mm -hmm. points we can see mm -hmm. how that weft lays in so all of that stuff to be able to see it up close 
is really, really handy. So I feel like because I've been standing next to you watching you weave tapestry for, for all of this time, I'm like, I can do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can do it. Now I actually have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Yeah. Yeah. You have done a little bit though. You did some meet and separates. You did kind of this exercise on your um what loom was that called? The big shack your... one, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's on the it's on the tapestry loom on the Eris loom that I have. Mm -hmm. Um the Aris loom. and uh yeah, it's been it's been borrowed, it's been going around the team and people have yeah. been trying it and things like that. Cool. So that's been really, really good. Um yeah, so I'm looking forward to seeing what people do because Anita took um, one of these looms as well. So she's she's doing some experimenting Perfect. as well. Um, so yeah, lots of things that are gonna be happening. And um, yeah, May 12th is the day that we kick off this entire study group and then you can join us there. And of course you can find all of the tapestry classes there um, all the time at the School of Sweet Georgia. So thank you so much for being with me today, Jana. Thank you so much for having this conversation. We're excited me. to get started. Me too.